Father, I pray, Lord, for this time that we're together in your word. Help our minds to be clear, our hearts to be open. Help us to compare everything we hear with the word of God to make sure that um, you are true always. It is your word that is above all things. I pray that your Holy Spirit, as always, will be the true teacher of the word of God, meeting us both together in you. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, we left off this two weeks ago, so we're kind of going to just do a little, little bit of refresher so you can kind of see what the purpose of it is. <clears throat> now, probably the first important thing um, as we moved through it last, last uh, two weeks ago was to remember that this is a prophecy, okay? This is a prophecy written 800 years before Jesus was born. That's really important to understand because the prophecy itself comes out of, um, where do we put it up here? Isaiah... To, oh, here it is. No, it's not it. I can't remember what's that. Isaiah uh, 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 11, 1 through 2. Probably should put that up there, huh? Oh, it's right there. Okay, that's what we're... And, and there's a purpose that we're studying this particular one because this is really where it comes out in, in Revelation. So let's go back to Revelation 1, 4, which is the basis of this, okay? So Revelation 1, 4 says... Little tiny words here. Um, yeah. Uh, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. Now, this is the pur purpose of it is that this is where the seven spirits are, okay? And so it's talking specifically in this verse about Jesus Christ, okay? It's a prophecy um, that... Um, that Jesus Christ would use the power of the Holy Spirit and that he would have it with an infinite amount of, uh, uh, he, he would have it with, without measure, okay? And that's really important. So we went through it from that, this is right here, Isaiah uh, 11, 1 through 2. And we went through it where it actually tells us what these seven spirits are. So this is them right here, the seven spirits. Um, what's important about it is, to, is, is a couple things. One, that Jesus Christ in this verse um, it has uh, the seven spirits, okay? And two, he has them without measure. And I use the, uh, the infinity sign here that there is no measure to this. Now, this is really important uh, to us because uh, we talked about it two weeks ago. What's important about this part right here is that many people think kind of logically <clears throat> that Jesus Christ used the power of the second person, right? Of the first, second person of the Trinity is who? Jesus, yeah, it's the Son of God, okay? It's the Son of God, okay? Son of God, and that's the second person. Who's the first person? God the Father, and the third person is the Holy Spirit, okay? So most people would think that the humanity of Jesus used that power, okay? But if you look at the scriptures, what it tells us is that, no, he does not use that power at all. Zero. So what it should do, I mean, a lot of times when I'm looking at something and I'm thinking about it, I call it begging the question. Sometimes you run into something in the scriptures and you go, well, that's weird. Yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. You know? And I call it begging the question. You see something and it, it, it goes, well, that doesn't make sense. How do I reconcile that? How do I, how do I make those things fit? And the only way you make things fit is kind of what we're doing here. You have to actually search the scripture for the doctrine and then overlay that doctrine on things so you find out what it's talking about. So that's why we're taking Isaiah 11 and we're putting it over Revelation 1-4 to understand what parts it's talking about with Jesus Christ. Okay, this is one of the very few pieces. You could also do this from the other side about just knowing that Jesus did this. But a lot of people do not know that it is Jesus Christ used only the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and he had a very specific reason for that. Um, and one of, the re one of the purposes of it is, is to understand that, and this sounds, this sounds stupid, but I'm going to say it. Most people, most Christians, um, almost deny the humanity of Jesus Christ. Uh, they know he's a human being, but what they don't do is they actually don't understand why the Father did what he did to Jesus Christ. I mean, we know a couple things that, uh, that, that it is the Father who put Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? Men assisted that, but God the Father put him on there. Okay? Um, 
and he put him on a very specific reason, obviously so that he could die for our sins. Okay? Um, so, and he didn't put the deity, he didn't put the second person on the cross because one, the second person wouldn't fit on the cross, right? If, if, if you know who God is, um, it's this piece right here, these pieces right here, and, and the part that causes him problems of being on the cross is this one right here, right? Omnipresence. Omnipresence just means that God is everywhere. And if God is everywhere, he can't be put to a cross. He can't put, be put to a place, okay? So that's the, that's the point. So Jesus Christ had to become a, a human being in order to die because God can't die either. Okay, so it tells you a lot about that. Another reason that Jesus Christ had to be a man is because whenever you have um, a relationship between two things, like God and humanity, you have to have an intermediary between them. That's somebody who can negotiate on both sides. In order to negotiate properly on both sides, you actually have to represent both sides. Okay? Now, if you think about an angel, an angel could not represent human beings. He doesn't have the ability. He doesn't understand us, doesn't know us, any more than we understand and know him, them. Okay? So it has to be a human being, and that human being is Jesus Christ. Now, the reason that's so important to understand this particular piece comes up uh, when we start here, and, and it's critical. So let's go to John uh, 7, 39 through, 37 through 39. It's going to tell us a bunch of things that may not make sense, but we'll make sense of them. It's on John 7, uh, 37 to 39. It says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures uh, has said, streams of living water uh, will flow from within him. Okay? So that tells us that anybody who believes in Jesus, this is going to happen. Okay? And it says, and it has an explanation for it. By this, he meant the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, whom those who believe in him were to later receive. See, this tells you a couple of things. Is that the later is Christianity. He's telling you that later because the people at the speaking of this thing were still in the time of Jewish, Judaism. They were still in the age of Israel. So they did not have this. This is very specific to us. Okay? And that's why, he clarifies, that's why the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit writes something, He clarifies us for, to understand things. So every word actually has a meaning in it. He says, and He says, Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not uh, yet been glorified. Okay? So this tells us that in the age of the Jews, whatever this is that God's going to give to us, the Jews did not have it. But Christians do. Okay? And that would happen at the glorification of Jesus Christ. And just to let you know, the glorification of Jesus Christ happened at the ascension. Okay? When he, when he went up, presented his gift of his sacrifice to God the Father in the temple that is in heaven. There, there is a temple that is in heaven. A, in fact, the, the temple that's in Jerusalem is a replica of the one that's in heaven. Okay? So when he talks about it, that, that's how you differentiate. In fact, you'll see times when, when David's talking, David will talk and he will pray to the, to the, to the temple in heaven. And there's times when Daniel will and, and other people do. So, um, but it's really specific about this thing. So this lets you know that we have this, and, uh, which is really important. So let's go to the next piece um, because it lets you know they didn't have it, we did have it, we had it after the ascension, all believers in Christianity. This makes a lot of sense of, of, of books like um, uh, Romans chapter 8. If you're familiar with Romans chapter 8, it says, anybody who does not have the Spirit is not saved. Okay? So um, that, should actually, that should actually beg some questions. Okay? One of the questions should be, as a Christian, is that if I do not feel... Not feel, I feel, feel. If I do not feel or see the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, I should be concerned. Right? Okay? Um, because that's not how God designed it. God designed us just like Jesus Christ. He designed us to operate within the Holy Spirit, with these seven spirits. Okay? So that's how we're designed. That's what God's plan is. And this was all planned by... Uh, 
just so you know, uh, we talked about it before, but God the Father is the planner. Okay? He's the planner of everything. Um, and, and that's easy to figure out because we've talked about that once before. How do we know that God the Father is the planner? Well, we know that it is God the Father who made Jesus go to the cross, right? It's his whole plan. Uh, this, this, the, the, um, the father sat there and said, um, okay, so uh, I'm going to make the plan. Jesus, guess what? You're going to be the one who implements it. And Holy Spirit, you're going to be the one who has the power through this whole time. Okay, through this whole time, the time that we're in now. So um, that's important to know. The seven spirits were given to, to him as a gift, just as they are given to us, just like that verse says. It is given to us also. This is the part where in, in John where Jesus talks about it and says, the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet, but when he comes, he will help you understand things. He will reveal to you all the things I have told you. Because the problem was that they didn't have the ability to understand them, if you remember that. Um, this helps you understand why you, um, you look at something like Pentecost, I mean, if you look at Pentecost, Pentecost happens 50 days after the resurrection, right? 50 days. Okay, so at Resurrection Sunday, which we just celebrated, okay, where are the disciples? Hiding. Hiding, that's right. They're, they're terrified, right? They're all hiding. Lock the door. Lock it good. We can get in that door. Except Jesus kind of will walk through it. But, um, <clears throat> so you see that. You see them as, as essential um, cowards. This, this really helps you understand a lot of things. It helps you understand that the disciples did not grasp everything that Jesus told them about, right? Because how many times did Jesus say, guess what, I'm going to be put on the cross. Three days later, I'm going to die. I'm going to die on the cross. Three days later, I'm going to rise. How many times did he say that? Over and over and over again. So you would think that a good Bible student, like the disciples should have been, would have been sitting there and say, good, this is a... Well, see, I call it Good Wednesday. Everybody calls it Good, good Friday, but... I call it Good Wednesday because, one, Friday is never mentioned in the Bible, and the only way that you can have three nights in three days is the crucifixion has to have happened on Wednesday, but that's here and there. So you would think that they were sitting there and going, okay, three days, three nights. Let's set the clock. Okay. And they should have been waiting at, at the grave. Wait, wait, he's coming. He's got to be coming out. Right? Have expectations. Are they, huh? they had expectations. They should have. He's told them over and over and over again. Right? You remember that? In the, old, in the Testament? He tells them over and over again. Yet, they're not there. So it tells you that they didn't get a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that they missed that Jesus told them. And uh, in fact, Jesus was so, um, <clears throat> so patient with them. If you remember, uh, how many times did he ask them if they wanted the Holy Spirit? Like three times? He said, they, he said, well, if you, know, if you want, I'll give you the Holy Spirit, and then you'll understand all this. And what do they do? Nothing. They don't say a word. Okay? Uh, so finally, Jesus gets fed up with them. I think he does. And, and he just says, okay, you know what I mean? I'm going to breathe the Holy Spirit on you so that you'll get, so you'll, and remember what this says? He breathed the Holy Spirit on them, and they understood everything. Okay? That was before Pentecost, though. So that was, that was not a permanent one. This is 50 days from here. That was not a permanent one. He did that back, uh, back over here somewhere. But he told them to wait here for, um, wait in Jerusalem, right? Wait in Jerusalem for the power. So he tells them. He tells them in Acts chapter 1. So at that time, you see the Holy Spirit come down. This is, uh, this is called, also called the first advent. It just means the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And all of a sudden, you see uh, Peter on fire, powerful. You know, everything you see from this moment on is nothing but power, nothing but truth, nothing but they're perfectly willing to stand and die. Okay? So, why is that important? Why is that important? Applies to us. Applies to us. I mean, do, do you, the reason. The important part to us is that we get this. This is ours. You have it today. Okay? It's in you. Okay? And um, the problem is you probably don't recognize some things in it. Let's read the last piece of this thing here, and we'll, and we'll go through some of the recognition piece of this. But the important part is, is that this is in you, and it is operational. There are things that make it inoperable. Okay? Because there's two things that are kind of confusing. One is called indwelling, and the other is called what? 
filled. Filled. These are two very different things. Okay. Indwelling you have when you're saved. Everybody has it. The moment you get saved, God the Holy Spirit puts a temple in you called the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in that temple resides Jesus Christ. That's why it says we are in Christ. Okay? He, he, it's, it's very similar to the temple where you have the Holy of Holies and you have the Shekinah glory. You familiar with the Shekinah glory? <laughs> the child, yeah, yeah. Shekinah glory was the in, the, in the temple, there was only two lights. You, you, they never allowed to have any natural light come into the temple. It was, they had to have the uh, menorah. They had to have the, can, the, the candelabras with the, with the lights in it because the purpose was that uh, natural light was not acceptable to God. So God had to have the seven stick candles and they, and, and they lit them. That was the light that was in the temple. No natural light was allowed in it. The only light that was allowed in the Holy of Holies was what? Shekinah glory. Okay? And the Shekinah glory is the glory of Jesus Christ that sat over top of the mercy seat between the two cherubs, remember? There's a mercy seat, and then there's two cherubs with the wings sticking out. Well, over top that mercy seat was the presence of God, the very presence of Jesus Christ himself, the second person. And it glowed out into that room. And that was the only light that was ever in there. They weren't allowed to bring anything in there of any sort. That was the only sort, okay? So when you look at ourselves, we are designed in that same temple. Okay, in reality, that's what the temple of the Holy Spirit is. That's what Jesus Christ's presence in us. And it is that light that shines out of us. Because we, like a planet, we're like planets. We don't have our own light. Okay? The only reason you see planets and other planets in the sky is because they get, this, they get their light from the sun. And we're the same way. We don't have light of our own. None. Zero. So, the importance of that is the same thing over here. Disciples are cowards... Because that's what human beings are. That's what we are. We're cowards. Okay, by design. I mean, I, I use, I like a, a, there's a nicer word for that. I like the word squirrel. You know, <laughs> human beings are like squirrels. You know, and um, the only way that you can not be a squirrel is by knowing the truth and by having the power of the Holy Spirit to stabilize that in us. Because if you find yourself as a Christian, whenever you're out of fellowship with God, you return to your squirrel state. Okay, it means you, you still do goofy things. Okay, um, so this is what happened to them in here. This is how they became power because that power that Jesus told them to wait for happened right here. And all of a sudden, all the bold stuff of their Christianity happens here. From that point on, we're the same way. Okay. The many offices of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? The many offices. The many offices, yeah. And, th and these, are, yeah. these are these pieces here, right here. The, the, the um, the, the cool thing about it is that this is the part right here that is, is operational. And what it says in the scriptures, so I tell you, be filled with the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.16. And then you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So we still have a sinful nature, but in reality, God the Father, in his plan, gave us the Holy Spirit's filling so that we would not be tempted by this. We would, not be, we would be tempted, but we would not have to succumb to it. You remember when Peter in chapter 17, he's talking to, um, they're talking about whether they should give the law to the Gentiles. Remember that part? He goes to the pillars of the church and he says, and, and uh, Paul and Barnabas come back and say, we went there and we see that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, well, should we give them the law? And remember what Peter's response to that was? His response was, why would we want to give that to them when we ourselves could not do it because of our flesh? Okay. That's an important thing to know. In reality, our flesh is always the same. The difference is, in the church time, our time we're in today, God has given us this. Okay? He has given us the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's why it says, if you're filled by it, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Because what, what that means is that when you are filled by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit controls your soul. Okay? When you are not filled with the Holy Spirit... The old sin nature controls your soul. So it's critical to know that. If, if you don't know that, you can live a whole life being good and nice and coming to church and giving tithes and reading your Bible and do nothing for God. Nothing. And when you, get to the, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, everything that you have done your whole life will be burned in a single second. And you will be there naked. Just like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 at the end. 
So you'll be there with the, with, with, the, with the shirt on your back, meaning that you won't have anything. Okay? So, just in case you didn't notice, to my personal opinion, this is the single most important doctrine of Christianity today. And it is one of the most ignored doctrines. So many priest Christians, because they are not taught this principle, um, will show up after that bonfire of, of good works, and they'll have nothing. Okay? So I hate to tell you, as of the hearing of this, you are now responsible for it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's go, let's go right here. This is a really important phrase right here. Luke uh, 2, verse 40. And I'll help you. Okay. Hmm. Okay, where is that verse? There it is. Um, and the child, talking about Jesus as a child, grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and grace, and the grace of God was upon him. That, that's, the, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, that's not the Holy Spirit like the omniscience part, uh, omnipresent part. This is the Holy Spirit like this, the fulfilling of Isaiah 11, 1, two, three, one through 2. Now, how old is, is Jesus here? Is that he's 12? Yeah, he's 12. He's a child. He's just a kid. Okay? So it tells us that um, he had that and that the Holy Spirit was part of that. So let's go to verse 46 and 47. And we'll see how the operation of that. Um, three day, three day, after three days, now you remember this is, what, this is when they came in for, I can't remember what it was, Passover. And they came in because they were required to. He lived up in Nazareth. His family came down to, to Jerusalem. They were required to go to the temple, especially during Passover, Pentecost, and some of the other ones. And what happened was that they left thinking that Jesus was with the other parts of the family because they did this in family groups. Okay? And where did they go? They, they, they're gone. I was going to say, where's that Jesus kid? You know? They can't find him. So they freak out, they go back and they start looking for him, okay? Um, this is that piece uh, there. So he says, um, they say, so he, he's three days, after three days, they, they find him in the temple. They're looking for him everywhere. Uh, sitting, and te sitting among the teachers and listening to him and asking them questions. Now, I would have loved to have sat through that one. That would have been some conversation. The other part is that, remember, he's 12. Like he's 12 years old. Um, everyone who heard him was amazed uh, at his understanding and his answers. Okay? This is a 12-year-old. Okay? When his parents uh, saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished that he was there, that he was in this conversation with the Sanhedrin. These are the smartest people. This is the, these are the smartest people on the Bible in the world. Okay? And Jesus is up there as a 12-year-old talking back and forth for three days. He's been there the whole time. Okay? His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And of course, he says the right answer here, perfect answer. He says, Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? Okay? And it says here how clueless they were. How kind of clueless they were. He says, uh, But they did not understand uh, what he was saying to them. They didn't, they didn't get it, okay? But what it does tell you is this, um, what I like about it, <clears throat> is that Jesus learned all of this in his humanity. It wasn't a gift to him. God didn't just say, to, hey, why don't you just, we're just going to join you up with the Holy Spirit. He's going to share everything with you, and you're going to be just like God. You're going to be as smart as can be. No, no, that, that didn't happen, okay? Jesus had to learn it on his own, on his very own. Just like we do. He had to study. The difference between him is that he had the Holy Spirit from birth. He knew who he was. In fact, I suspect he always knew who he was. When he actually became cognizant of himself, he became aware of who he was. Um, I bet he got picked on by his brothers a lot. <laughs> sure, walk on water, why don't you? you know, that kind of stuff. You know. <laughs> the stuff that brothers and sisters do. But the, the important part of this thing is that it was his humanity. He was 12 years old. He had to study. He had to study just like we do. Okay? We have no excuse. This is how God set it up for his son. This is how God set it up for us. Okay? Um, God does give us gifts. Okay? Um, those gifts are gifts from the Holy Spirit to 
make his team, kind of, okay, as part of the plan of God. But that team is to, um, they have people, I'll call them like the quarterback, will be like Charles. Charles is a quarterback. Joe is a quarterback. Um, the rest of us are, are, are uh, well, I don't know much about football anymore, but um, they're like ends. They're like uh, halfbacks. They're like the linemen. Okay? Um, the analogy that, that Paul uses is that they're like the body. Okay? In reality, they all play a role, and uh, it's really important that everybody plays a role, or the team doesn't go forward. An example is that you can have the greatest, for you guys who watch football, I don't watch football at all, just to let you know. But I played it when I was a kid. But if you have a great quarterback, but he has a horrible line, what happens to the quarterback? He gets sacked every single play. Okay? He doesn't throw anything. He doesn't go anywhere. He just gets his butt whooped okay? until he's kind of done. Um, and if you have a great line, but you have a horrible quarterback, guess what? Kind of the same thing. Nothing, nothing really happens. Okay? You have to have both. So when God puts together his team, which he does, at the time we're saved, we get, we get, a, we get, the, uh, we get this role that we play, this, this spiritual gift. We are expected to carry that gift out. Okay? If we do not, then Christianity suffers. Okay? Christianity suffers. The plan of God suffers. Okay? The problem within the United States today is not because we have a terrible president, although we do. I said that out loud, huh? Um, but, and not because our Congress is really messed up. And they are. Okay? It's because Christians do not live this life. And because we do not live this life, we have no power. We have no influence. We don't do anything to those people around us. Okay? And the fewer Christians there are who walk this life, the darker the nation gets until finally it's put under discipline and wiped out. This has happened throughout history. Okay? So let's go to, um, let's go to the last summary pieces here. I have a couple pieces here. So the pieces that the Holy Spirit that, that you will recognize, hopefully. This is a New Testament kind of what you... Twice. That's not going to happen again. Yeah, no. Windy, yeah. Windy in here. Um, the first part you're going to recognize in the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. Okay? You're going to recognize that. The second thing you're going to recognize in Christianity in the New Testament is the wisdom of, of the Holy Spirit to apply doctrine. Okay? Because you can read the Word of God and not know how to apply it. You can not know how, it, how to do it. Okay? Uh, understanding. This is perception. Okay? Now, at the time that you were saved, God put a human spirit into you. That's the biblical human spirit, not, not the one they talk about outside the church. I'm talking about the, the human spirit itself. And it is that human spirit that you will have forever. So when it tells you that you're born again, that's the part that's born. Okay, you're born from above. That's what, Nicodemus, that's what Jesus says to Nicodemus. You're born from above. You have a human spirit. It is that human spirit that has the ability to talk and communicate with the Holy Spirit. So with it, well, you're actually listening to this today, as you listen to me, if you are in fellowship with the Lord and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, that human spirit that you have is fully operational, as is the Holy Spirit, because you have not grieved Him or quenched Him. You're familiar with those verses. And now, when the Holy Spirit has the ability to help you understand things of God. Okay? If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, is it... I think it's chapter 2 also, where it says, to the regular man, the wisdom of God is foolishness. Okay? But to the spiritual man, okay, that's the word is called pneumatikos, to the spiritual man, he knows all things because he knows the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ. Okay? So you can't sit there and say, well, I don't know what I should do. Okay? Because the word of God teaches you what you should do about everything. Okay? The other part is uh, the counsel. <laughs> the counsel. This is the plan of God. Okay? So whenever you wonder what you're supposed to be doing, it is found in the plan of God that is revealed by the Holy Spirit to you, personally and individually. Okay? God will reveal it to you. Now, um, I hate to break it to you. Maybe you, you like that part. But the, the, the plan of God, when God has a plan for you, that plan is for where you are right now, where you live. 
It's not being a missionary. It's not doing, it may be being a missionary. If you have a spirit that God has given you to be a missionary, you will know it. It'll drive you. In fact, it'll drive you till you do it. Okay? Same thing with uh, being a pastor, being a teacher, or even being a helper. People who help, they look like they help too much. It's because they, they have that spirit. It drives them crazy. They have to help. Um, and, and there's a lot of other ones like that. But this is where you find that. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He, he's the one who reveals God's plan to you. If you do not do the plan of God for your life, Christianity as a whole suffers. The United States suffers. Your family suffers. The country and the city suffer because you didn't do your part. Okay? That's how God's plan works. It works through us. And when we don't do our part, when we don't recognize this plan, sometimes we look at something and we say, oh, I want to do this, and we do something completely different. And you can usually tell when we do that is because you have a disaster. You usually follow it pretty quickly. If you, um, when you make decisions on your own, you kind of do what, um, what David did. Remember what David did with Bathsheba? Where was David supposed to be when the Bathsheba incident happened? He was supposed to be at war. That's right. He was supposed to be out there with the army. Okay? He said, oh, you know, they guys have that. that you know, they have that. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Joab. Joab. Yeah, Joab. I was trying to think of Joab. Yeah. Joab, he can take care of that. Yeah, he can do all this stuff. I, I can be up here. Okay? That's called being out of the geographical will of God. When you find yourself out of the geographical will of God, it means that you're not supposed to be there. Okay? Um, when uh, Jonah was on the fish going towards Tarshish, on, on the ship going towards Tarshish, what was he doing? Running away from the geographical will of God. Where did God want them? Yeah, in Assyria, right? So finally God had to send a big fish, swallow them up, chew them up, <laughs> spit them out for a couple of days, and toss them out on the, on the shore. And then finally said, okay, I think I'll do it. You know? But God had to intervene to get him in the geographic will of God. So this is why you don't make decisions on your own. Okay? You don't make decisions on your own. Um, <coughs> virtue. This is this piece. Now, hopefully we all know what this piece fits in, right? We are virtual producers. That's what we do. When we walk in the Holy Spirit, we produce virtue by, 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 by virtue of that. Okay? You can't produce virtue any other way. Okay? You, you can't. Um, so you have two pieces. God's given us two pieces here. He's given us what's called a motivational virtue and a functional virtue. The motivational virtue is when you desire to do God's will. And you do that from knowledge of Him, from His presence in your life. From, when you seek God, God never runs away. Guess what? Isn't that strange? So guess what? The problem you have if you're not close enough to God isn't His fault. It's yours. Okay? Our job is to seek Him. And whenever we seek Him, God will never turn us away. So that is the motivation. The more that we know God the more that that virtue uh, becomes known to us. And, be and out of that becomes functional virtue. Virtue comes out of motivation. When you seek God, you, you say yes to God. You say yes to things in your, in your life. You change the things that, okay, I know what I want to do. This is what God wants to do. I'm doing what God wants me to do. That's called functional virtue. Functional virtue means that it actually plays out in your life. You actually do it. Okay? This is why if you know something and you don't do it, it doesn't help, right? You might as well not have known it. Okay, this one here is the objective knowledge of God. Uh, this is uh, objective knowledge of God. This is knowing what God's uh, doctrines. This is Bible doctrine is what this is. This is the doctrines that you know. Um, a, a good example of, of, of doctrines that you know is that when you, when you have something um, that you think God wants you to do, uh, you run it past the doctrines that you know. That's why important. Doctrines are principles. That's what they are. They're principles that God teaches you from taking them out of the Word of God, out of all those nice stories. You know, uh, I hate to tell it to you, stories are really nice in the Bible, but God does not want you to know the stories. He wants you to know the doctrine because the stories are really hard to apply, right? Most of us aren't on ships. Most of us aren't called to go to Assyria. Uh, most of us aren't talk, uh, called to go and preach to the kings. Okay, um, So you have to know uh, the objective will of God and the principles of God so that you can apply them to your own life. So you can kind of go, okay, I really want to punch this guy in the nose. God says it's not a good idea. <laughs> Guess who's running this ship? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it the old sin nature? Okay, that's an easy question, right? <laughs> easy answer. So it's that kind of stuff. It's the objectivity. When you, you know, for years, uh, Jeannie and I were talking about... Uh, 
changing churches. And one of the principles I knew about God was that I don't have the right to make decisions on my own. Doesn't that sound strange? So I'm not the captain of my ship, I suppose, like the, the old thing says. But what I am is, is I am a servant of God. And no matter how much I think or feel, and there was plenty of times I thought and felt that I wanted to change. I wanted to do something. I want to, I want to get out of here. Okay? I want to do something different. This is, God said, nope. This is the principle. If, if you're mine, if and you are, you'll do what I ask you to if you love me. And so I waited. And Gene and I had lots of conversations. Saying, no. God, God has his way. I'll know when he tells us to do this stuff. I'll, I'll know. I'll, I'll, I'll understand it. I'll know what it looks like when I hear it. I don't know what it looks like today, but when he says it to me, I'll get it. And sure enough, when he said it to me, it wasn't even the end of the day. I go, I got this. I know, I know what this is. This is Claire's Bell. Because I had waited for that. And I didn't even know what it looked like. But I knew it when God said it. And so I made that choice at that moment. Okay? So a lot of times when you think of something in your own mentality, you have to think about the things you know about God so that you don't do bad things and hurt yourself or do, or do stupid things. Okay? Which are really easy to do as a Christian because, guess what? We have a sin nature and we have the mentality of a squirrel. Okay? So, um, the fear of the Lord. This is um, the, the reverence uh, for God. But also, this is the thing... Um, that allows us to be totally occupied with who God is. Okay? Who Jesus Christ is. That's why it's the Lord, not God. It doesn't say fear of God. It says fear of the Lord. Okay? And we talked from before that the fear of the Lord is one person, right? It's always singular. And that person is what the whole Bible study is about, what the entire book is about. It's about Jesus Christ. Is that once we know these things, it is God the Holy Spirit who will show us this and will teach us this. And if you haven't recognized it yet, this is us. This is that the same thing that God the Father gave to Jesus Christ and he lived in his whole life is the same thing that he has given to us. Okay? That's important like we were talking about before. Is that the only bold life you live, and I don't... I'm not talking about being bold and going shaking people say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Now, some people may have that gift, but I don't have it. Um, I'm not an evangelist, but it's not that part. It's the boldness of your life. It's the boldness of credibility. One of the neat things about God is, you know, God's not a squirrel. He, he's not rude. He's not inconsiderate. He's not liberal. He's not. If you look at who God is, God is very conservative. He's very patient. He's very clear. He's very exact. He's very stable. That's who he is. And guess what we're supposed to be? Just like him. Okay? So when you, when you, fall, when you find yourself doing things that are uh, not stable, that are um, emotional, weird, you know that you have violated this right here because God's not like that. Okay? He's not like that. So, let me see if I have anything else missing here. Okay, my whole point with that was, if you do not know your mission from God, you can't complete it. Okay, you can't complete it. And the only way that you can complete it is by knowing God's Word and by having the Holy Spirit do this same assistance that He did with that 12-year-old. Okay, because that 12-year-old was the humanity of Jesus Christ. His deity knew everything. And we're just like that. It is our humanity that must be taught this, that must have this allegiance. Okay? We are as responsible as Jesus Christ is. And we have the power that Jesus Christ has. Okay? But the power that we have is not to go out and heal the well, maybe heal, not for me anyway. The power that we have was, is within that plan that God has. Do you ever wonder why, you know when he was in the desert, Jesus in the desert, and he's on top, of, uh, Satan brings him up to the top of the temple, and Satan says, you know, jump off. Okay, jump off. You know, the, the, and he quotes a verse out of Psalms. He says, and the angels will come down and pick you up so that not even your toe will touch the ground. And what does Jesus say? Remember? Very, very tempting verse, isn't it? He's the son of God. He's the most powerful person in the world in the whole universe. What has he said? Do not tempt the Lord your God. Hmm. Interesting. Do not tempt the Lord your God. Which means that it's not that, that is one, he was correcting Satan on his, on his doctrine. What Satan was doing was misapplying a doctrine. Okay? 
misapplying the word of God. And what Jesus was telling him is that, you know something? God's not unstable. God's not weird. God does not want me to jump off of here. That would be rude. That would be wrong. God's stable. And so he was correcting him on that. And that's how he is with us too. God teaches us stuff to have our lives be stable exactly where we're at. Okay? So, let's move on to verse 5. Any questions? Well, trust me, we'll come about this again. <laughs> but. When you said that when you knew that God had, had put that in you to change churches, how is that connected to how Jeannie was... I mean, maybe she didn't hear it at that time. Do you coordinate messages, or do you just run with what you... No, what happened on that particular one, I'll, I'll say this even on the video, <laughs> but what happened on that one is that we had... Um, um, how do I say it? How do I say it without being... We, we had... Uh, um, well, I don't know how to say it without getting in trouble. Well, it's too personal. That's no, it's not personal. It's not personal. We, we actually had somebody who was persecuting us and kind of taunting us and really struggling with, with basic interpretations of the scripture. I wasn't the only one Charles had that same experience. And, um, but for me, I actually wanted to leave the church because I knew that it was not right for me to sit under somebody who would do that. Okay, I, I know the word of God. But on the other hand, God didn't say, go ahead, go out this door. And my doctrine, as I understood it, sat there and said, you know something? When God tells you to move, you move and not before. Uh, that's the principle all over the scriptures for me. And so Jeannie would be, would be pressed in this exact same way. And she would go, ah, can we leave this church? And I go, no, honey. Yeah, I, I get it. I get what you're saying. I, I get it. I understand it. But no, God hasn't told me to leave. Okay, and my wife, who's a wonderful believer, as you, as you probably all know, is that she would sit there and go, "Okay, I'll trust you," which is what a wife should do with her husband. You know, she trusted me. She trusted me that I understood what God was saying. Okay, now at the time I was in that, like for nine years, <laughs> and for a lot of years for Jeannie too, is that we actually didn't know what the why we were there. We didn't get it. Okay. But when, but when God opened that door very clearly and we got through the door on the other side, we looked back and say, I get it completely now. I understood what that was for. Th there was something I went through as a Christian that I would never have gotten any other way. And, and Jeannie was the same way. It, it changed us. It taught us patience. It taught us to pray for those people who persecute you. P pray for those people who say bad things behind your back. Uh, and, and for years. It, so it teaches you that is something you cannot get on your own. So I look back at now and say, I, I praise the Lord. I, I wish, I'm glad I did what he asked me to because now I look at it. I have changed as a person over those nine years of having to do that. And even when, uh, when we left, we were very honorable even without leaving. Because God said, it is wrong for you to do otherwise. It's my battle, not yours. Mind your own business and do what I told you to. I said, okay, got it. Yeah, so that's kind of the details of it. But yeah, it was, uh, it, it was good. It just didn't, and that's, and that's how God is sometimes. Sometimes the things that you're in, you sit and say, what have I done wrong? You know? It's an easy test. If you've done something wrong in your Christian life, you will know it because you will be out of you will be out of fellowship with God. You'll, you'll see it. You'll see it in your life. If you don't know Bible doctrine, if you don't know the principles of God, you can't tell when you're in or out because your mind doesn't help you with that. Okay? In reality, is our minds cannot help us. It is only the Word of God that helps us. I mean, in reality, think about it when you first started becoming a Christian. A lot of things you did with, with no problem whatsoever. They didn't even bug you. Then you became a Christian. You started reading God's Word and you go, I can't do that. All of a sudden, you're convicted. All of a sudden, you see a truth that nobody else sees, and it convicts you. It changes you. And that's what God's mind is. God's mind is that mind that is true all the time, and that whenever you're in a frustration, you can turn to it and find the answers to it. It's absolutely, there's no truer words ever in the whole universe. And that's what's so cool about it. So let's go to, any other questions? Let's go to verse 5. Revelation 1.5. Oh. <laughs> but you forgot where we were at, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along, yeah. Probably need to erase some of this stuff, huh? Yeah, let's... 
Give me some of this stuff. So just give me a second. Yeah, clean slate, it actually helps me. Uh, I avoid writing things if there's things all over the board, so I apologize for the. And as you can see, I'm a person who has to write things. So, verse 5, it says, um, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, um, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Um, this has a, a, a lot to say. So let's kind of take a look at the, at kind of the Greek part of that thing, uh, just some of the emphasis pieces. <coughs> um, let me see, what's in here? The, the Jesus Christ part is obviously humanity is Jesus. Christ is his, um, is his appointed title. The, the word um, where it says faithful witness, that, that's the word to be a martyr again. And the word is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. It's, it's a word that means faith. It's the Greek word for faith, but it can be used for doctrine, faith, uh, for faithful and other things like that. But the, the key one here is the firstborn um, Firstborn of the dead. Now, interesting enough, the the uh, firstborn from the dead shows up a couple places. But I want to let you know something that this actually isn't the word dead. It's actually deads. <laughs> okay, happens a lot. Uh, this is plural. This is a plural. The this is a plural. Uh, nekros is the word. N e k r. Oops, wrong Greek R. <laughs> Regular R. R o s. Nekros. And this is the stuff that you you know you know to be necrotic is to be something that's dead. <clears throat> this, whenever it's talked about, is talking about the body. Um, when there's spiritual death, the word is thanatos. T h a n. Uh, I think it's a t. Oh, this is a little short a. Thanatos. This is spiritual death. And the Bible separates them. It's good that we do too. Many times, the, the important reason I'm bringing this up is many times the word death, specifically, comes up in the Bible and it's translated like a singular. But in reality, the majority of the time it's actually plural. Okay? And... Um, and this one's talking about body, okay? So this, is, this will kind of drive us. There's two directions I'm going to drive us here. Uh, one's going to be future, one's going to be now. But this, this death here, um, the firstborn of the dead, has two pieces that are important. One, the firstborn, okay, and of the deads. Um, who do you think the deads is? Especially now it's plural. It's, it's easy to lose it with dead because he's dead, Jesus Christ, right? But it's... It actually is more doctrinal when you realize that it's plural. So who are the deads? The ones that died before, like yeah, that are waiting. yeah, all those. Yeah, exactly. This is this is this is the whole piece of believers. Okay, have the believer. Um, we'll hopefully we'll have the opportunity to die. Okay, that's a that's a because I mean, if, you, if you're raptured in the church, you, you, you know you're going to miss the death. And you're not going to know what it feels like, and then you're going to have to listen to all those people tell you about it. <laughs> but if you die, then you kind of get to have that. You know, that's kind of cool. That's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> um, and, and not only that, but our, our Lord died, so I mean, we're, we're, we're in no more trouble than He was. Like the Corinthians says, if uh, in fact Joe was talking about it two weeks ago, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, where he said he was talking about the resurrection. He says, if, if the resurrection is not true, our faith is worthless. Why? Because if God can't raise Jesus Christ, just what? He can't raise us. And it would make our faith worthless. But he's talking about the firstborn. And this is an important doctrine. It shows up in other places. Um, we'll come back to it. Let's just kind of keep, we'll leave that piece right there for now. Um, for him who has loved us. Yes? There were others who, who were resurrected by the prophets and then by Jesus himself. But those right. were... Who died again? Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's, it's it's called a resuscitation. Very good. Yes. But him, he is forever. He is forever. That's right. Yeah, you look at Lazarus. You look at um, the the kid that fell out the window when Paul was teaching. You look at all those. The the young man that, that Elijah laid on top. They were all resuscitated, but they all died later on. 
Okay, so there was uh, that that miracle had a all those miracles had a purpose. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. In, in reality, he is the firstborn of the dead. Nobody has done this yet, right? Today, there are no other firstborn. He, he's the only one, right? Yeah. There's nobody else been resurrected. Right. He, he, he's the only one. So that's still true today. Um, at the rapture. We will be, right? The dead in Christ rise first. Okay, the people who are dead. And those who are alive will be translated. Okay? And that will be, and that's why he is the first one. That's why this is the second resurrection in reality. It's actually the first resurrection, and I think we talked about this. The first resurrection, like it talks about in, um, okay, first resurrection actually has Jesus Christ is the A, right? The first resurrection. The second group that's resurrected is the rapture, right? Christianity. And the, the third one is the Old Testament and tribulational Jews, or tribulational believers, not just Jews. Okay? And they're resurrected at the second advent, right? I mean, when else could they be? <laughs> okay? Um, the verse is very specific about this, and and this makes sense because they're on the uh, Jesus is on the earth at this time, right? He comes to the earth. Where does he come to here? The, sky. the air, yeah. Very different words, very different Greek words. This is not that. Okay, even we know that in English. <laughs> Don't have to be confused about it. And then the fourth one is the uh, millennial saints. Okay, those who are in the millennium, who died in the millennium. There won't be many people who die in the millennium, but those who do, who are believers, will be resurrected. And then, um, in the second death, all right? The second yeah, yeah, second resurrection. Oops. Second resurrection is is who? Yeah, all unbelievers. Yeah, unbelievers, and that takes place. Um, there are some things that are questionable about that. Uh, n not this. This happens at the White Throne Judgment, right? Yeah. Um, but there are some questions about people like the, uh, um, the Antichrist and the, um, and the, um, the Antichrist and the, not the beast. Yeah, the false prophet. That's what I was looking for. There's two here. The uh, beast or the Antichrist. Um, beast. Antichrist, uh, King of the West, all that stuff, and the, the false prophet, okay? We'll learn about these fellows. Um, this is the guy who lives in, in the West, King of the West, and this is the guy who is the uh, ruler of Israel during the tribulation. So to, but that happens here, the, uh, the White Throne Judgment, because, uh, okay, we'll get to that in chapter 20. Okay, so those are those people. So it's really important to know that the firstborn, Jesus is the one who God raised first, and that this is the second one that comes in that, and the third, and then the fourth. This is all part of the first resurrection. And you know this by, uh, we're not going to really talk about it, I'll just bring it up because it kind of begs a question. Um, we know that this <coughs> encompasses the first resurrection because it says, blessed are those who are in the first resurrection, right? So... If the, if the first resurrection isn't over this period, then Jesus Christ the man has a problem. <laughs> or we have a problem. One of the two of us. Right? Because we weren't resurrected with him and he's not resurrected with us. There's two different periods of time. So the first resurrection has to take place in kind of like echelons. Kind of like, uh, almost like platoons on a parade field. Okay? Makes sense. So let's watch him for a second because it actually has some uh, significance. Um, okay, church, okay, and, to, and the part to us, uh, to him who has loved us in here is the church age. We are the us in that one. And who has released us uh, from our sins. And this is the, uh, we'll get to that, but that's like the uh, redemption, propitiation, all that stuff. Now, the, another piece I want to take you to is this next verse here. Um, Isaiah 53, 9. How much time do we have anyway? Oh, we don't have any time. <laughs> we have one whole minute. Okay, so 
with that whole minute, we're going to come back to this one next week. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about the, the other of, of the, uh, of the uh, firstborn of the dead, of the deads. Um, but I want you to think about that, that many times in what happens, and, and I'll show you where it's at. In fact, I, I have an interlinear. We can actually look at it. Um, it kind of shows the Greek. But one of the most important things is the firstborn of the dead. That many times, it, they won't, translators won't translate it plural because it doesn't make sense to them, okay? Um, and that's, that is many times important doctrines are lost because the translator won't just translate it, okay? And this is an example of one of them. If you looked at this, you could think that was referring to him, but once you see it's plural, it's clear he's talking about all believers, okay? Um, this will also happen here, uh, again, where the word dead is again talking about Jesus is dead. When it says Jesus is death, it is not death. It is deaths. And because the translator won't translate the plural, it messes up a lot of people's doctrine. Okay? We'll get back. That's kind of an interesting thing. But we'll get back to that next week. Um, any questions? Let's wrap it up. This might be off the, off the topic, but the people that died before, like Isaac, Abraham, and things like that, that Jesus, when he died, went down. To paradise. Were they suffering during that time because no. there was no kingdom or there was, there was no Jesus? Mm -mm. No, no, not at all. Because they experienced a lot of death. Uh, what other they beheaded or right? No, they didn't at all. And the only difference between us and them is that they were looking forward to Christ. We're looking back. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the 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 death of Christ on the cross. There's a verse that sits there and says that God showed His mercy by not um, what's the word He looks for by not calling to account the the sins of men before the cross because He had the right to do that. But because the death of Jesus Christ, when God pronounced it to be true in the scriptures, he pronounced it to be true, as true as anything will ever be. When God pronounces something, an example of that, was that when you look at Revelation, it's the future. But because God has written it, it's actually what would be called the historical future. Okay? It's history, it just doesn't happen yet. But it will happen exactly the way. So when God put Jesus on the cross, even though he had not died yet for those sins, God reserved those sins and held them until the actual cross took place. So yeah, theirs was the same as ours. The difference is that, that there was a place called paradise that God kept them in because no human being could come into heaven until Jesus Christ did. Okay? So let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great and wonderful love for us, that you have done so much for us. I pray by reading your, your, your word, Lord, by testing your Holy Spirit, that you will show us exactly what you have in mind for us. That plan that you have put before each one of us since the beginning of time, that we will not miss one piece of it, that we will do what you put before us, and have the glory uh, forever of that, uh, of having done what you asked us to, just like Jesus Christ. I ask it in his name who did it perfectly. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Thanks. Oh. Hmm.